Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 46, we're going to learn how to solder. Yep, we're going to do a soldering 101. And in this first part, we're going to look at the tools and supplies. But, first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present. And soldering irons can be very hot and can catch your stuff on fire. So be careful with that too. The high voltages can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. When I talk about the coming kit amps, I get two responses. The first one is, fantastic! Let me know when they're available. This fall sometime. And the second is, I suck big time at soldering, exclamation mark times infinity. <laughs> well, I've got news for you. Almost everyone sucks big time at soldering at first. But with the right tools and supplies and a few minutes of instruction and a little bit of practice, you will be ready to build your first tube amp kit or tackle any tube amp mod or repair that needs doing. It's just not that hard. So let's take a quick look at the tools and supplies. Okay, right off the bat, you're going to need a good soldering iron, temperature controlled. Now, I love this style. I forget the style of tip, but you'll, when you find it, the right, the right iron, there's your, there's your heat element, or your, yeah, your heating element. And they don't last forever. So if you buy a really expensive one, it, you'll be able to buy replacement elements. Uh, you know, I buy fairly inexpensive ones that um, have a little digital control on the base. I can't drag it up here. It's just not easy on camera, but watch this. So there's your replacement tip. You see how it fits on there? I'm doing this upside down, backwards, sideways, as you know, because I'm watching the camera instead of watching what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> so, it it just threads on. You don't need to put a big wrench on this. Just It just gets snugged up like that, right? Now, the beauty of this system is that you can buy a little set of replacement tips so if you have a variety of work, some very fine work, you're going to use a very fine tip here. Let me grab one of the really fine tips out of here. Okay, there's a little, can you see it? Take a look at the difference. Now, this is for very small work. This is a 1 8 chisel chip tip. And I use that for 90% of my solder work. It's a little big for some work. So on some work, I come in on the tip. And for a lot of the work, I come in on the flat. Now, the reason I like this big tip is, A, it can do a lot of work. It can do some of the heavier work I do. And I can sneak it in and do some of the lighter work if I'm careful. I used to change tips constantly, and it drove me nuts, and I burnt myself a few times. So that convinced me to learn how to solder with the 1-8 chisel. And the thing about a bigger tip is it holds the heat. So you can solder, 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 and you never lose temperature, or you lose very little. With the small tips, you dissipate the heat fairly quickly. So it's a little harder to hold up the temperature on these things. Okay, so... Temperature control, that's the key. You want a base unit. They don't have to be incredibly expensive, but get the replaceable tips and get one that's temperature controlled. Okay, let's toss these things aside. I didn't solder, start soldering well until I went with a high quality solder. And this is um, Kester's Rosin Core, 63% tin, 37% lead, which is slightly different than the normal. I think the normal is um, is going to have a little bit more tin and a little less lead. And this flows beautifully. A lot of professional shops use this exact product. I'm gonna, don't, you don't have to stare at the camera trying to find the product number. I'll put it down below. 
um, in the comments under the video. And the key is that this is a very small diameter solder. So it's 0 0.031 inches or 0.8 millimeters. And hang up, let me pull some off the reel. Oh yeah, a solder reel is really handy. See this little puppy? They're not expensive. You can find them cheap all over the place. But look how small that is. Can you see that? My fingers are not big, folks. <laughs> well, that thumb has been hit so many times with a hammer, it's getting big. But anyways, it's a very small diameter. Rosin core just means that in the center of the solder, we've got some rosin. And that helps the solder flow, and it helps it make a clean surface contact. And in the next episode, um, we'll, when we actually do some demonstrations, you'll see why that's so important. Okay, so we're talking rosin. Sometimes there's not enough in the core of the solder for the task at hand. Maybe you've got a little bigger soldering job, maybe it's slightly more challenging. So you're going to use a little bit of rosin. And I mean a little bit. When I first started doing this, when I first started soldering, I was using a Q-tip to apply it. <laughs> and I was making a god-awful mess. Now, I use a little tiny bamboo toothpick. Let me show you this. This stuff's sticky. But you want it sticky. It's got it. You want it staying in place. There it is. And uh, so you just take a tiny little dab on the end of that toothpick. The next episode I'll show you how much. And it'll melt and flow out almost immediately when it temperature hits. Okay, so prep is absolutely key. If you have an oxidized surface um, that that you're trying to solder something to, let's say a resistor onto it. Hang on, let me grab, um, I should have grabbed these earlier, but having a bin of parts right at the bench is really handy. I can just go and grab these. Well, they're in the package, but you can see these things. And we'll work with these next week. Some of these vintage parts have been hanging around for 50 years, and these these are tinned um, tag strips, and they'll oxidize. So what do you do about that? Get a little bit of 220 black paper. You don't need to wet it. And you just get in there, and you just clean, you just clean that surface. It only takes a few swipes, and you get rid of the oxidation. So this is one way to prep. You don't want anything coarser than 220. And, you know, 240 is fine, but once you get up in the high 200s, you know, you're polishing the thing. You, you just want to wipe off the dirt and the crud and the oxidation, right? Another way to prep is to use a nice stiff little mini brush. I use, I have a, a set in the store. Um, what have I got? I've got a brass one, I've got a nylon one, and this is the stainless steel one. And I use this constantly for prep work. I use it to clean uh, dirty pins on t on tubes. Anyways, they, and they wear out eventually. I throw one out every couple of months. But uh, these are fabulous for getting into a spot and just cleaning the surface. Especially if you're doing repair work. Okay, what if you're working on a circuit board? Well, generally speaking, they, they come with a clean surface from the factory, but there's something that's always res residual on the pads. See these little solder pads here? So what I do is I get a 3M blue scrubby, not a cheap dollar store thing. Hang on, I think I've got the package somewhere. Hang on. There we go. Scotch Bright 3M. This is the perfect grade. It's just coarse enough that it gets the surface cleaned up, and it's not so coarse it scratches the board up. So what I do is I take the new board and I put a little bit of soap on the pad and I put it right underneath the kitchen faucet and I scrub it under soap and water, right under the tap, both ways, both sides. It only takes a few minutes. Rinse it off thoroughly. Rinse it off. Put it somewhere to dry. Wipe it off. Put it somewhere to dry. Do not start soldering on a wet board or you'll, <laughs> you'll find out what it means to have water jumping all over the place, superheated. <laughs> okay, so what if you fuck up? Pardon my language, but we all do. 
you need, this is the simplest form of solder sucker I found. And all it is is a suction pump. See that end there? Watch this. See? And these are fabulous. They're not expensive. I stock them. Um, you can find them all over the place. I don't, you know, I go in, I have one local electronics supplier. And you'd think that they have these things at the cache, but no, they don't have them. Now, these get filled up. They suck up the solder, right? See, here's a little bit of, of a core. It can get really bad. So you just open the thing up. They just come apart, right? Just, just unscrew it. There's your plunger. Just, you know, carefully knock it out into the garbage. Remember, this is, we're dealing with, um, with a, a tin lead mixture. So if you're soldering and you're going to go eat some food, go wash your hands in soap and water. Yep. And if you're soldering, you're going to have some fumes coming off. So a little fan is handy. A window, I'm lucky. I have two windows right near the corner where my soldering station is. So I open them up. I've tried using a fan and it drives me bloody nuts. You got, you got this fan whirring away and you're trying to focus. So the windows work it for me. If I was a production shop, I would have some sort of a fume hood sucking the stuff off. But for the little bit of soldering I do, that's fine. So a solder sucker, there are, you know, big stations you can buy for desoldering large jobs. And if you're into repair work, you're going to want something like that. What else? This, this handy hand thing, you know, you can grab on to virtually anything a component, set it up. You can even put it underneath the magnifying glass, clip it on, then your hands free. And th these are wonderful. They're not expensive. The base is a nice little piece of cast iron or steel and they're fully adjustable. They're wonderful. Really good snips that you can get in close. I had crappy snips for years and then my local electronics store put a case of these at the cache. <laughs> I, I saw these and I said, I, I, I don't even want to know how much they cost. I don't care. These look fabulous and they are. And don't use these on anything hard. They're, they're meant to snip little leads and stuff like that. And they'll last a lifetime, two lifetimes. You take care of it. And little needle nose pliers. And I mean little. Look how fine these things are. You'll use these constantly. Okay, so that's, that's a quick overview of the supplies that you're going to need. And next week, we're actually going to do some soldering, unless something more exciting comes along. Okay, let's clear the decks because we're going to have some fun, and I mean some fun, opening up a tube package. It's going to be our first unwrapping. Now, you heard me right, we're going to have to unwrap this parcel. This sucker came from afar, and it's wrapped up old school. But first, let's look at some of the old tubes that came in. Oh, yeah, and I wanted to talk about these. A whole bunch, big case, <laughs> heavy case, you know, with the overweight sticker on it came in of these Nishikon power capacitors for the kits. Parts are coming. I'm getting as many parts packages these days as I'm getting kit pack, uh, kit packages. Uh, focus, Jim. Uh, two packages. I'm getting excited about the kits. Um, I'm putting a lot of work into them. Why am I talking about power capacitors? Well, these things are the key to quiet amplifiers. They do the filtering, these big guys do the filtering job of the power supply and they get out the noise. And good quality Nishikon capacitors cost a bundle, but they do a great job they're well made and best of all, these things have a finite life because they're constantly charging and releasing and charging and releasing. And as a result, they wear out basically. And then your amp gets noisy. In fact, this is one of the number one repairs when an old amp comes into a shop, the, the power filter capacitors are almost always toast and, um, and need to be replaced. So a lot of those came in and, okay, tubes. Let's talk tubes. Okay, a whole bunch of number 42s came in. Now, 
I'm bringing these out not because everybody out there is using 42s, but because they're early tubes, they're fun to look at, and eventually I'm going to have a tube amp kit for them. So, <laughs> get ready. Now, these are really low powered. I think you can get three quarters of a watt. So, you need about, you're going to need 93 dB or more, probably, preferably closer to 96 dB efficient speakers. And there's actually quite a few out there that are like that. But have a look at this. This is why I pulled this one out. It's got an old sticker from the shop. And it looks like California something Ornwall. Would that be Cornwall? I don't know. I didn't look it up. There's the postal code, 2130. I wonder if that's still valid. But look at the date on this. Can you see that? The shop put a little tag on and dated it 1939. Isn't that amazing? Now, it looks a little beat up. It's a Philco. You can still see the number. These, of course, are um, early pentodes. And um, they'll go into a single-ended amp, almost certainly. And they've got an interesting six pen. See that? So with six pens, the, it's, it's a modern tube in the sense that the, um, that the, ca the, the um, cathode is indirectly heated, right? These two big fat pins are almost certainly the heater pins. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, look at this, a gorgeous Sylvania. But look, it's got green paint. And what, what does that remind you? Well, that reminds me of the armed forces. So almost certainly this is an army um, tube, maybe Navy, because they would have slopped green paint around too, I'm sure. Um, and this is actually really quite common on vintage tubes. Uh, people painted around gear and left everything uncovered. <laughs> and let's face it, if you're 17 or 18 and and hell-bent for, for killing some enemy and uh, you, you were handed a paintbrush and a bucket of paint, you're probably not too focused on the task at hand. Anyways, is this tube wrecked? Well, the paint will probably smell a little bit, um, but no. Uh, in most cases, you can just get a sharp knife like this. I use this knife in the shop constantly. Get the blade out, and look at that. Just, just gently, just gently. Now, check where the label is. Yeah, it's, it's right underneath here, so be careful. But just get most of it off, and then go ahead. Where did I put that thing? There it is. Get your little scrubber. I use these all the time. And with the little tiny bits... Just get in there with a little bit of alcohol water blend, you know, 50-50, I tell you. That's what you use as a cleaner. And just, there, you can see the label is just, it's under there, right there. So just gently clean it off, and then come back with the knife and get the last little chips of the paint that you didn't get the first time. Bob's your uncle. You can save a tube like that. It'll look 99% when you're done cleaning it up. Let's just put that blade away. <laughs> this thing is sharp really sharp and uh, I nick myself constantly just because I'm not aware where the tip is when I'm picking it up. Anyways, so I try to put it away properly. Look at this box, new old stock, look at the gathering or the silvering. Isn't that gorgeous? Now, look at the pins. So even the box, it looks beat up. This is very much a new old stock tube. Boxes that are this old, we're talking about perhaps a uh, maybe an 80-year-old box, they're going to look like this. If they look brand new, I would be suspicious. Um, but one of the ways, two, two of the good ways to tell if this truly was new old stock, because a lot of repair shops throw the old tube in the box when they're on the job just to get rid of it, and then they forget about it. That happens more often than I, I can recount, at least a quarter of the time, with really old, uh, new old stock, new in the box tubes. The old tube, probably the old noisy or dead tube is in the box. So, you look at the pins, you've heard me say this before, the pins are pristine. If the pins were a little iffy, you could look at the gathering, and if the gathering is perfect and huge, like look at it, it's like a mirror, then you know, most likely it's either been very lightly used, as in hardly at all, 
or it's it is a new tube. Okay, La I promise you the last number forty two. These all came in this week, and the boxes are gorgeous. Look at this Raytheon tube. Isn't that amazing? And it's got this neat kind of a rivet and a sort of a hinge on the tube. And I couldn't get in. I couldn't safely get in. And I think what happened is, you see how the box is all warped? I think it got a little wet at some point, and the inner inside stuck. So I actually had to bust my way out, which I hate doing, but I did this time. I know, it's bad. I love vintage boxes, but I couldn't figure out how to, and I wasn't going to wet the box again. So have a look at that. Another new old stock, new in the box tube. Isn't that gorgeous? And this is, see the stamp on this? This is fairly modern. So you know this is near the end of the number 42 manufacturing era. Then have a look at, um, at the Philco. You see how that's stamped in there? That's almost always a sign of an earlier version of the tube or an earlier date of manufacture. Some of these were hot stamped and they really are pretty exciting. And those I believe are the earliest of the type. Okay, let's just put these aside and let's get into the unwrapping. I'll show you what I mean. Have a look at this. It's wrapped up in cloth, old school. And where did it come from? Pakistan. Okay, how to get into this thing? Well, I don't. I didn't do any prep work, so it's going to take us a couple of minutes. So bear with me here. I have no idea how well wrapped this is. Oh, it's coming open pretty easily. Now, in some parts of the world, this is, this is, this is, you know, the way things have always been done. When I had my cabinet shop, I remember reading stories about fine cabinet makers who would build a fine piece of furniture, and then they would build a case in wood to ship it. Now, that's not that exciting, is it? But they would dovetail the case. <laughs> And I bet you I could grab 10 traditional cabinet makers today and half of them wouldn't know how to cut a hand, hand cut a dovetail in a few seconds the way the old timers did. Anyways, probably not too many of you are interested in fine furniture. So let's get back to the business of opening this thing up. Let's back up a bit. Okay. Look at... Oh, it's, what in the world? Was it opened by customs? They didn't put the sticker on it. Maybe they just didn't seal it up? No, it's been opened by somebody. Let's see. Oh, look what we've got here. Isn't that amazing? These are CV6s. Um, CV just stands for Common Valve 6, and um, I believe that's a mil-spec designation, a, U a UK one. Let's look at the boxes. Hultron, radio tube, anything else on them? That's it, just that and the tube number. And look at the nice sleeve. I can feel the grit. These these have been stored in a warehouse somewhere. Can we get these out safely? There we go. Have a look at that. Now, isn't that interesting? It's got the plate. Can you see that? It's got the plate way up at the top. So, what in the world's going on? Because most of these CV6s... Now, I should backtrack. I think if you've been following me, you know that this is the driver tube for the little Yuri, the monoblock and they sound fantastic. And I've been bringing in a couple of different types and they're all vintage. Um, many of them go, let's see if we've got a date code on here, a nine, a dash, a three. I don't know. Is that 1943, the ninth uh, month, perhaps? I don't know the 
I don't know the uh, Haltron code, so sometimes you just have to guess. So anyways, um, and there's another tube number on here. This is the E, in the U.S. it's known as, one of the designations, it's the E1148, and you can see they put the CV6 on as well. Okay, so what's going on here? The regular CV6 has a pair of top caps, right? It has a, a plate and it has a grid. Let me see if I got it backwards. I, oh, it's tricky on this one. Usually I can see right away. This is the outside connection. So that's the plate and that's the grid connection. Whichever one of these goes to the outside edge, that's always the plate. And whatever goes to the inside connection, that's always the grid, because the grid, of course, is wound up the middle, right? Okay, now normally in a tube, you're going to have the plate vertical, right? Some form of vertical, down here, or up here, or up at the top, whatever, vertical. Here, it's horizontally mounted. And the reason they've done that is for the... Um, the specified application, which is radar, high frequency radar, they wanted to have as little chance of interference as possible with the connections, which is why these top caps were here in the first place. So by move, turning the, the plate sideways and moving it right up to the top, they get that connection even shorter. Interesting, eh? I can't wait to plug these in and hear the, how they sound. And there's a good chunk of a, an original case here, I think. They sure look like they're probably all from the same lot. Isn't that neat? Okay. Well, if you've stayed till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. The store has been absolutely insane um, lately. And if... If... Ah, here we go. If you spend $150 or more after discount, the shipping is free. And I have um, flat rate shipping at $20 around the world. And we now have the option to track if you want to pay a little extra. Some places I'm just not going to be able to track to. And some places are bloody expensive. Everything goes out airmail. So everything is going to arrive at the same, same speed. So anyways, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and more signing off. Cheers, everyone.